Thank you. This is the link to get the slides. The slides are pretty much a bunch of resources you are going to need today. So go to equalizedigital.com slash WP, y'all, all lowercase, and that will redirect to the Google Slides. This is our outline. Yes, you will get food, but just to give you an idea of what we'll be talking about today and how it's gonna go, I'm gonna give a brief intro of some information for about 15 minutes. Then I'm gonna demo automated testing and then keyboard testing. At noon, we will take a break. Everyone can go get food. I'm gonna kinda do a 30-ish minute break. And then um, at that point, we'll do a screen reader testing demo. And then I have time set up for everyone to independently test using some of the tools uh, that we have talked about. And then we'll come back as a group and talk about some of the things we found, uh, things that maybe surprised you, or if you saw something you want to know how to fix it, we could talk about that too as a group, which might be kind of fun. So that's the plan. Um, I want to start, we're going to, you know, I know everyone just came in from a break and sat down, but we're going to move around for a minute. And I'm going to start by asking you to stand if a question applies to you. So if you have ever coded a WordPress plugin, can you please stand up? Okay, how about if you have ever coded a WordPress theme, can you stand up? Stay standing, don't sit back down. Okay, how about if you've ever written content on a WordPress website? Stand up. Oh yay, everyone, great. Just in case you're wondering, if you're standing, you are responsible for accessibility. <laughs> so it's really important that we all know, you can sit down now. Uh, that accessibility is everyone's responsibility. My partner Steve talked a little bit about um, that accessibility on the dev side, and some people think that accessibility only happens in development, and only developers have to know how to test for accessibility, but that is not the case. Anyone who touches a website, whether you're writing content, whether you're designing it, whether you are coding it out, or whether you're just the person who maintains it and updates plugins, hitting a little button. You still need to know about accessibility. I have a graphic up here that shows our process and the different phases we do on sort of a timeline. It goes from discovery to content to design to development, testing and debug, user testing and remediation, then launch, and then training and post-launch support. And the timeline just keeps going off the screen because that part never ends. <laughs> and above it, there is a graphic with an arrow pointing both ways and it says accessibility. And this is really to highlight that accessibility happens all the time. We don't think of accessibility when we're building websites as something that only happens in development or only happens in testing. When we're doing discovery, we're talking about accessibility with our clients. When we're writing content, uh, getting content from them, before we even start building, we're figuring out if there are things we can do to improve the accessibility of that content before it even hits the website, right? So it's really important to know that. When we come to actually testing a website, which is what we're gonna talk about and practice here today, uh, basically we have a four-ish step process and the way we approach it is we run automated bulk scanning tools to check for obvious accessibility problems. Um, we'll be looking at automated tools first. The reason, why do we do this first? Because there are some problems, not all, but there are some, maybe even many accessibility problems that can be definitively found with an automated checker. And you can save yourself a lot of time by using a quick tool and then fixing those problems before you actually have a human being test the website. So do automated scanning. If you can use a tool that bulk scans the entire site, that's even better because then you can get a high level overview instead of having to go one page at a time and it might help you figure out how to prioritize problems. Then after that, we manually test a representative page of every type. So what does this mean? Like our home page, if we have post types, whether it's a blog or a portfolio, we do the archives and a single. 
for that. And then any pages that have special features. So your contact page with a form, your checkout page, if you have a WooCommerce store, anything that has special functionality you want people to be able to engage with. And when you are manually testing, we do three things. First, we do keyboard only testing. Then just on the normal desktop or laptop, as it were, version of the website. And then we do it with the website zoomed in 200%. And then we do it with the website zoomed in 400%. And again, we're going to demo all of this. And then after the keyboard testing, we go back through the website with the screen reader. So then in our process, we resolve all of the issues from the scan and the manual testing. Maybe some of those issues are getting resolved from the scan before manual testing is even done, right? But we resolve all of those issues. And then bonus points, if you can, is having actual users, uh, typically screen reader users, but it could also be other people, people with neurodivergence, um, people who have mobility challenges and maybe use um, voice to text or uh, eye tracking in order to use the web. You might want to have them come and test as well. So today, I do not have a lot of time to tell you about everything you have to find. Uh, I wish I did. So, but unfortunately, we'd probably be here for about 10 hours if I tried to explain every WCAG guideline. But what I do want to do is give a quick intro to these links that I have here, because you'll want to reference them as you're doing your own testing later. So the first one goes over to the W3 website where you can actually get the web content accessibility guidelines. Um, let me, maybe I can zoom in here. There we go. Um, when we are testing, I have this open all the time. Um, each, what, what is important to know about these guidelines, um, they're grouped into four groups, anything with a number. So right now we're looking at the very first one, which is, um, 1.1 text alternatives, but what falls under that is the very first success criterion, which is 1.1.1 non-text content. Um, and this is a level A. There's three different levels. Level A is the lowest, then it's double A, and then triple A. Double A is generally considered the standard for what you need to do in order to comply with most laws. Um, AAA is better. It may not always be achievable in certain situations. So it's kind of long. It takes a little bit with each of these of reading through. If you're not sure what something means, there are links uh, in that section right below. The first one is understanding, and this says understanding non-text content. So they'll have one that explains it, and it has very detailed information about what does this success criterion mean, um, where can it maybe imply, what's the, what's the intent behind it, that sort of information. And then they also have a link, how to meet non-text content. And that jumps us over to the new version of 2.1, which you could also just use. But I've been more familiar, and I tend to keep, stay on the other page. But if we expand the high techniques and failures, then we can see a bunch of resources that are helpful for us in um, actually meeting this. And there are thing, more information about testing for it. That is incredibly dense documentation. And we might have just lost our feet. Let me check. Maybe. Don't fall. <laughs> I see now it has a tie. So maybe I should take advantage of that in a minute. Um, so the other thing that I've shared here is a spreadsheet that we have created um, for our own internal use. And what it has is it has each success criterion, which version it is, so 2.0 or 2.1. Why does that matter? In the United States, Section 508, which is what applies to federally funded websites, um, which could be higher ed, could be government, could be a nonprofit getting a federal grant, they're technically only required to meet 2.0. Now, most of our clients are doing 2.1 anyway. But you could have someone say, I only care about 2.0. So that's where you might pay attention to what version they're from. Um, we have the impacted population, who this might apply to. And then this summary sheet 
explanation has some more detailed list out of these are specific things. So the things that we were talking about for non-text content were um, images, form image buttons, image map hotspots have appropriate or equivalent alternative text, images that do not convey content or are decorative actually have an empty alt. Uh, uh, you need to have form buttons that have descriptive value, form inputs have associated text labels, so there's a label above the field, um, and, and a few other things. But basically, this is sort of like our checklist that we've created for ourselves internally to help us know like what are specific issues we might see and how can we map that to a success criterion. And the reason why is because when we're delivering audit reports to clients, we're always telling them what success criterion it maps to. Um, so that's what that one is. Then the next reference material that I have linked for y'all is our, what we call our shift left with accessibility checklist. And basically what this is, is a checklist that we created for our internal use on everything that needs to happen at each phase of our website process in order to ensure that we are meeting accessibility. Um, so again, I said accessibility starts with discovery. It starts with discovery, content, design, development, testing, user testing, training, and post-launch. Um, so this is also a very helpful resource, and especially when you get to um, like some of the stuff under design. So again, this is in the design phase, but if you're testing a website, there may be things that we've grouped under design that you would see when you're testing that website. Um, Again, I don't have enough time to go through all this, but I'm trying to give you guys the tools, and then later on, if there's questions about them, um, where I'm happy to discuss them or answer any specific things. And then the last reference material that I've given you is a spreadsheet, which you are welcome to copy. This is the actual format that um, we use when we are providing audit reports to our clients. So this spreadsheet, we give it an issue number, we'll put in a code snippet, and I have an example issue in. Um, so I'll give it a code snippet, then the check is like our little summary of what it is, kind of a brief explanation. If there's an image, we'll put an image in. We use an extension called Image Kit, which is a free Google Sheets extension so that you can add images in. Uh, then we'll have a description that's kind of like a explanation of why it's a problem or what the problem is. We will say where the issue exists on the website. Sometimes this is, like this one says header. Sometimes it'll list a specific page or if we're testing just like an element or a block, we might list the block name that it exists in, those sorts of things. Then we'll have a recommended fix. Um, and then we give a severity. We think of severity in three ways. Um, basically we say high, medium, low. High is anything that is a critical failure that would stop someone from being able to use the website. So form fields missing labels, critical failure, right? You cannot submit, someone on a screen reader wouldn't know what goes in what field. So that is a high priority item. A medium for us is something that is a clear um, WCAG violation, but it, it could be worked around. So it still has to be fixed if you want to be accessible and compliant, but it's something like, for example, missing skip links on a website. If you don't know what that is, that's okay. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, it's annoying. <laughs> you have to add them to be compliant, but it's not a critical failure. Uh, and then low, for us, we only call things low if they are a best practice or a, they're not clearly a WCAG violation but it's a usability thing that could impact folks that we think is important, then we'll report that as low. Um, and then the way the sheet works, it has two tabs. The second tab is that same WCAG thing that we looked at before, that um, little cheat sheet I had. If you choose a success criterion from the drop down here, it will automatically, well it should, if it's going to function, yeah. It, um, it will automatically fill in the next three columns from the, the WCAG version, the level, and the impacted populations uh, from the WCAG map that we have on the sheet. So those are the resources I have for you all. 
And now we're going to get into automated testing. I know I'm flying, <laughs> but I think everybody came here for the demo, so I didn't want to talk to you about all the different rules and everything like that. Um, we're going to be talking about a few different tools, and I'm going to show you different ones. Um, so the first one is, and they're all listed on here if you want to find them, um, the headings map plugin. What we're going to do is I have, and we, I actually took the password protection off this. So if anyone wants to go to uh, roadwarriorprd.wpengine.com, you are welcome to. The password protection will go back up after today. Uh, this is my old company's website. <laughs> so it's nothing like showing where you used to be. <laughs> We took it down, but I saved it because it's really great for demoing accessibility problems. <laughs> and we have all been there, right? Um, <laughs> sorry? It's a hate project. <laughs> it is a hate project. There is a reason why my company does not have this website anymore. <laughs> so, um, so what I'm going to do actually, yeah. So I am logged in right now, and I think I'll stay logged in, but I may at some points flip back and forth. So one thing I will note is that there are some issues that will come up in the WordPress admin bar that could be distracting. So a lot of times I find it helpful to not be logged in um, when I'm doing testing. So for, yes. Yes, it's road warrior, W-A-R-R-I-O-R. -R prd.wpengine.com. Yep. Um, so the first little tiny helpers I want to show you, that's what I call them. I don't know if that's a good name for it. But they're little tools that do a few things. I'm on the home page of this website. I have the headings map um, Chrome extension. And there's also a Firefox extension for this one. Uh, let me see if I can zoom in a little more here. Yeah. All right. So. What I have done is I've just, I have that installed. I just hit it. Real quick, what this does is it gives me an outline of all of the headings that are available on the page. And it will flag for me in red if they are out of order. So um, right away, I can see when I'm looking at this that I go from a heading one to a heading three, uh, then to a heading four. So that's the right order, but we skipped heading two, right? Um, and then there's sub items. When I'm looking at this and assessing this, I look at a couple things. Not just is the heading order skipped, but also is anything here tagged as a heading that maybe shouldn't be? <laughs> so if we look at this right now, the, the main website has that heading of we build brands online. And then it says below it in a heading three, data-driven strategy and innovative digital solutions for nonprofit, social good, and enterprise organizations. Is that really a heading? What do we think? No. no. We probably tagged it as a heading three because we wanted it to be big. <laughs> We've all probably done that once, right? So, so I'm looking at this, and, and it's not just about, oh, that needs to be heading two. Like, you have to sort of think critically about some of this stuff, right? And that's why automated tools can only get us so far. So I would go if I was going to fix this, and that would not be a heading. Um, so I would go through all of that. I also look for headings that are missing or that aren't clear. I can see there's definitely some stuff down in the footer that is a little confusing. Like I see I have a, an H2 that's our phone number. Let me scroll down over here. We'll, we'll talk in just a minute about reflow. Uh, but I've got this, where is that phone number? OK, yeah, so, so again, the phone number and it you know, has a weird email address because we did search and replace. Um, but again, I don't think that's a heading. And then below that, we've got the scene on and connect. So one thing that I'd think about is I could either make those scene ons and connects also H2s, so they're higher up in the hierarchy, the outline of the page, because they shouldn't really be nested under whatever's above them. But sometimes we don't like doing that. So another way that we frequently will do this on clients' websites is and, and our owns is we'll have a hidden screen reader only H2 that says footer. 
and then we make these sub-items, the xenon and the connect, we'd make it an H3, and they're nested over the footer, and the nice thing about having that hidden screen reader link is that a screen reader user could hear all of the headings, and they could go, oh, I just want to jump to the footer. And they could use that H2 footer to skip right to the footer. So there's different ways. Um, so this is this tool and some things you might think about if you're using it on your own website. Uh, let me reset my... So another tool that I find super neat is um, Tably. It's Tab A11Y, Chrome extension. I don't know that this one has a Firefox extension. So basically, I turn it on, and I can change my colors and set some different things. I'm going to leave default settings. I just hit Run Tably. It's going to tab through my page. And then what it does, again, we're going to ignore at the top bar where we've got, we come back up to the WordPress admin bar. Normally, I'd be logged out. Um, but I can see a zero on my skip to content, then a one on Roadware Creative Logo, two going across the nav. So what it's done is it has found every tab stop on this website, every focusable element, and it has put a line and a number. So I can see, are they in the right order? Um, you still have to do this yourself, but it is really important to, um, it's really important or it's really helpful, sorry, to have a tool like this because if I wanted to screenshot this real quick, so what I'm noticing right here is my go button doesn't have a tab stop on it. Maybe it's not a button. We could look at that in a minute. I could just screenshot this and give this to our dev and be like, I don't know why, but I can't tab to that. Um, or if the order jumps back and forth, you really want it to follow left to right and down the order of the page. So you could look and see if there's something where I was down here and it skipped something, or it jumped back up, or it went to the right and then to the left. So that's sort of a cool tool. Yes? Can you say again how you got this? Yep, so this is a Chrome extension. It's on, it is linked on our slides called Tab Ali, Ali, A11Y. So let me turn it off. Oh wait, I'm just gonna reload the page, that might be faster. And then um, another one that is kind of neat is um, Colorblindly. What I like about Colorblindly is it allows you to very quickly mimic different levels of um, color blindness. So we could toggle a different one on. And one of the things we want to look at, now this website, it fails color contrast. I'm going to tell you right now, that bright green with white, I just know that looking at that, it's going to fail. But if you had different colors where you were, you should never communicate something with color alone, but let's say you had two different colors, you want to make sure that even if someone can't see all of the light spectrums, that they still look sufficiently different. And so that's where a tool like this can be helpful. So we'll go back to normal. And I know I'm going fast, you guys. <laughs> um, so, so those are some of the like tiny helpers that I'll use. Uh, and then what we get into then are scanners. And we can do some, you can use WordPress plugins. So I have ours. There's also two others that are similar to ours, different in different ways, but WordPress plugins that are available. Um, and then you can also use browser extension scanners, or you can use SaaS software that will do like bulk scanning, two examples of which are SiteImprove or Monsito. So when we're testing our own websites, we do use our tool. Um, we will go, it has the ability to run a full site scan in the pro version. And so I can come in and I can just scan everywhere and I can see something like there are 7,380 links that open in a new window or tab on this website. Um, in our plugin, we have errors and warnings. Errors are something that is definitively a problem. A warning is either a best practice, but not a clear violation or it's something that it just requires human assessment. Um, so ARIA Hidden is a really great example of that, and we could 
click into ARIA Hidden and take a look at some of these. Um, so right here, what I have, and, and right now it's, it's definitely pretty de developer friendly as far as the code. We're working on some things to make it less so, but um, we're not less developer friendly, but more friendly to non-code readers. Um, but for example, what I have here, this is a warning. I have an ARIA hidden on a link. I happen to know this font awesome, just because I'm familiar with this website. It's my website, is down in the footer. We have some, some links here, right? Um, now, ARIA hidden means a screen reader will not be able to access the icon. But what I would do if, I, oops, wrong, sorry. We don't need to go LinkedIn, okay. So what I would do is I would inspect this and I would want to see if there was any alternative. So in this instance, I can see I have a link. All right, I have a link that goes to the LinkedIn page. Look, it's opening in a new tab. I'd probably remove that. We don't link to new tabs anymore on our social media. Um, and then the icon that's hidden and then inside that same link, I have screen reader text that's hidden that says LinkedIn. So what I know actually is that it's correct that this icon is hidden. People don't need to know there's an icon there because they can, they'll can still hear something meaningful. Um, so you do have to do some looking at HTML and getting familiar with what HTML structure would be as part of your testing. Um, so in our specific tool, um, this is what we might call it's not really a false positive, but it's something that I had to review and decide, right, if it's a problem or not. But I don't wanna see that again because it's gonna show up on every page. So on the fast track, I would actually go in here. Um, this happens to be the Instagram one. I can find the LinkedIn one, but this one's at the top. And I could hit, this one's already has one actually. I could hit global ignore, and then it wouldn't show me that ever again on any current pages or any future pages. Um, so that's sort of a tool. So we do a lot of this where we go through and we'll look at what's in the header and the footer and some of those reports. Um, when we're editing individual pages, we'll go through um, and, and look at the reports here. So um, this is another example of a false positive. I have a Facebook pixel and we've, we've noticed it doesn't have alt text, but. Facebook pixels don't need alt text, so, so I would also probably enter a global ignore for this. But I could look at things like um, ambiguous anchor text. Oh, I've got a button with a learn more. I could go find that and make that be more meaningful, learn more about what, um, and explain what that is. So, oops, sorry. So we'll go through and, and use the automated tools first. Um, there are other automated scanners. I don't have time to show all of them to you, but I did want to show you all Axe Pro because one of the things I really like about Axe Pro is that they have some tools to help you with some guided manual testing. Um, it is paid. They have a free version of Axe. Um, the Pro is 49 a month. So let me show you that real quick. So if I go into Axe Dev Tools, and I actually think I'm going to now log out of this website. Back to the home page. Also, we don't need to be zoomed in. All right. So I'm just going to start by scanning all of my page. And it has found what it thinks are eight issues that are serious. If I click on one of them, then, so what it's flagged for me is color contrast. Um, what I think is somewhat useful to note about any of these tools, and ours too, like you may notice that we missed some things. You noticed our tool found that learn more button and was like, hey, this doesn't work. Axe didn't. But there are things that Axe might find that we won't find. So a lot of times we are using multiple tools um, because it's better to have more thorough testing in your automation. Um, but what I really like, oh, also one thing that's nice about 
Axe Pro, if you pay for it, is you can actually save and export the reports if you need to to like a CSV. Um, so let me go over to guided tests. Um, I'm gonna, it's gonna, the first time you go, it's gonna ask you to save it. You just give it whatever you want. You know, it'll default to the page name. Um, maybe. Oh, it's connected to my phone. Oh, there we go, okay. Um, so there's done some automatic testing and then I could do different things. Um, let me see what's a good one to show you. So, so we could do the image check. So it's gonna, you pick a test, it says let's get started. You know, this is what we're gonna do, we're gonna hit start. Now it's gonna go through and capture screenshots of all the images it finds, finds on the page. And then we can select what we want to test. Right now, I'm, I'm going to select all. We might not actually finish them all. but um, so, so the first thing it says, select all of the images that are used solely for decoration. So what I could do is I could look at all of the screenshots. And some things are a little weird. Like there's a group here where it took it's actually text. Um, but I could look at, for example, this Tommy's logo, and let me see if I can find that one. Yeah, okay, so, so these are down here. I actually, no, that's not decorative. That's meaningful, because it tells you who your clients are. So let's see, are there any decorative images? There might not be. So okay, there are no decorative images here. So I would just hit next. Now if I selected one, and you don't have to worry if it took a picture of something that's not really an image, it doesn't matter, because it'll skip it. But, but we could just pretend that actually I'm saying, oh, this, this image back here, it found this one, th this is a decorative image. Um, so I'm gonna hit next. Then it wants to know, select all the images excluding logos that contain text. Well, I know right now none of the images, we don't have images of text, so I'm just gonna skip it. And then um, does the accessible text tell you what the image is for? So what it does is it shows you the image and it gives you the alternative text that we have on it. So in this one, it happens to say Road Warrior Creative logo. And also it's a link. So does that tell you what the link is for? No, where do we think the, the what would be better alternative text for this? Anyone have any ideas? Yeah, go to the homepage, Roadware Creative homepage. So that's something really important with images and alternative text. You want the alternative text to explain the purpose of the image, not necessarily what the image is. Sometimes the purpose of the image is what the image is, right? But sometimes it's where it goes <laughs> or what it does. Um, so in this one, I would say no. And then what happens is it would actually go through all of them if we were going to. Um, and then it ends up saving all the things that I said, oh, this one's actually decorative. If that one has alt text, which it shouldn't, it would save that as an issue. Um, in this one, we, it would save that we said, no, this doesn't have it, and it would create issues. And so, so this is a handy tool because it can help you learn about some of those tests that you could also just do manually on your own. Um, so that's why I like Axe Pro. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, the clicking on that would redirect them to. Yep. Yeah, so you would have you would have a normal HTML a tag for a link, and then um, you'd have an image inside it. And the point specifically was that when you're linking an image, the alternative text on the image is what gets read out. Um, so we can actually listen to this um, after lunch when we do screen reader stuff. And it will, so this would say link, Roadward Creative logo. So if I were to hear that as a screen reader user, I would think that that link would take me to the logo, like maybe I wanted to download the file or save it, right? Um, so that's why you would want it to say, you know, go to Roadware Creative homepage. Now there's a whole other conversation about whether on the homepage that link should actually exist. 
because it just reloads the same page, which is a little bit weird and confusing. But, um, but again, that's one thing that it's not really a, an accessibility violation, but it's nicer for usability. Um, does that kind of answer the question? Yeah. Okay. So the other really popular automated tool is Wave. A lot of people like Wave. It's the most used. It's also the one that I've noticed when I've read like lawsuit briefs gets mentioned. I think Wave is handy. I'll like quickly use it, especially on like a plugin demo website if it's a new plugin I've never used before and I'm trying to see what issues might exist. Um, there's some stuff about it that I don't think are as great, one of which is um, that it lists, yes, you can see, look at, we have 438 contrast errors. <laughs> uh, which you might say, there's not actually 438 issues here. Um, I'm sidetracking, but this is actually good. So anything you see in a wave report that looks kind of grayed out and not full means that it's visually hidden on the page. Um, what I know about this page is that this whole section here in the green, it actually changes depending upon what you choose in the drop downs. Um, so, so there's a couple of ways, and if I were to click on one of these, so if I click on something I can see, it will jump me there and show it to me, but if I click on something that is hidden, it wouldn't be able to show me this particular element. So you can either expand the code up, and then click on the hidden thing, and it would show you, um, start it well in that instance, it showed it, but, um, but it will show you in the code, or you can also just quickly turn the styles off for the entire page. That's a little harder with the color contrast error <laughs> to actually see what the problem is. But if there's something else you can't find, that's another quick way to now make everything is visible because display none or whatever might be on that is no longer on it. Um, what I caution about Wave though is for example, images missing or with empty alternative attributes, they call that a feature, which it could be a feature if it's a decorative image and it's correct for it, but it could not be. So don't, don't just think, oh, I only have to look at the errors. You also need to go through the features. Um, so, yes? That example that you have right now, mm -hmm. is that image an example of a decorative image? Did you put in alt text or something like that? <laughs> so, yeah, so that's, that's an interesting question, right? Um, the alt text on this image is the whole enchilada, which uh, really is not good alternative text at all. Um, it could be a decorative image, but I tend to err on the side of um, any photograph is not decorative because that photograph is communicating something. Uh, so the text here, which probably many of us cannot read because it fails contrast, says, hello, startup. So you need the whole enchilada. We can help with that, whether this is your first venture or your fifth, blah, 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 right? Um, and then it has a picture of enchiladas, and the idea being it's trying to communicate like a personality thing, right? Like we're not just, yeah, we're, <laughs> we're not just being like, here's your stock photo of a website. <laughs> Right? Um, so also this website, we did a lot of work for food brands. So what would be better is if we like, like I think people need to know that there's an image of an enchilada there because it communicates something, but I would be more descriptive of what it is, you know. So. Yeah. Um, okay. Does anyone have any questions about automated tools before I do some keyboard testing? Yes. Not necessarily the tool per se, but you mentioned something with the social media icons that we no longer open those in a targeted go spot in a new window. Can you just address when it's okay, if it's okay, to open any link in the new window? Yes. So the question was, can I address when it's okay to open any link in a new window? Generally, it is almost never recommended to open anything in a new window. Um, the exception being, for example, on a form, when someone has to accept privacy policies and you want to link to that privacy policy, obviously you want to open that in a new window because you don't want them to lose their progress on the form. 
That would be like one example in which you should do it. You still have to warn about it. But generally, you should not open anything in a new window. That is a massive battle that we have with clients all the time. Um, and they're like, well, any offset link should open in a new window. Well, really, you should give users the ability to control and decide how they want to open links. Um, it is not a clear WCAG violation, so it's harder to like convince them with this is you know the success criterion that you are failing, and so therefore you can't do it. Um, but what is recommended uh, is having a visible warning um, and an auditory warning for screen reader users. So um, we actually have a plugin that's free on .org. Like it's so basic, I don't even think it has a fancy image. <laughs> But it, it's called Accessibility New Window Warnings. And when you turn it on, it looks for any of those target equals blanks. And it will add a little icon. And it will add screen reader warning. Um, and it works, too, if you have linked images that go. Like, it'll put the little icon next to them or social media icons, um, that sort of stuff. So. OK. So let's say I've done all my automated testing and I fixed all those problems. So there was a ton that I just could have fixed off of my automated scans, right? Um, so we're going to pretend I did that. Now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to come and I'm going to keyboard test. Uh, the first thing I do is I hit tab. So I noticed something. I hit tab and it went right to the logo. What you need on a website is um, skip links. So the first thing that I should expect to see, and they do not exist on this website, but I will show you on, this is a not a live website yet. <laughs> it's for our podcast we're starting. Um, and I'm, I'm showing you on this website for a specific purpose. So if I hit, well, where was I? So if I hit tab for the first time, I want to see a link pop up that was previously hidden that says skip to content. What this allows someone to do is bypass the navigation. And this does have a success criterion. It's called bypass blocks. Um, bypass the navigation and get right to the content uh, so that they don't have to go through the navigation menu on every page they visit. Like every time they click a link, then they're forced to go through nav and before they can hear what they want. Right? Um, obviously, there's other ways. They could just do an H1 and skip that way. But what if there's content before the H1? Because that happens. <laughs> Not great, but it does happen. So really, we want to have a skipped content link. So I check to see this is here. On the other website, fail. It's missing. If one exists, I then test the functionality. And this is really important. Don't just say, oh, it's there. So it's a link, which means you use the return key. So I hit the return key. It visually scrolled me down. But what I want to make sure of is that it um, actually shifted my focus to that area. So you might expect to see a focus outline around the content when it goes to that if the styles have been added for that. And that's super ideal. But if not, you can quickly check that just by hitting tab. So if I hit tab, I'm going to expect my tab to go to the first focusable element. So that happens to be a listen on Apple podcast uh, SVG that is linked. So I'm going to hit tab. What did it do? It went to accessibility craft, which was actually the next focusable item. This thing drove me bananas. And there's a whole other conversation we're going to have on this podcast about why I chose to build this website this way just to torture myself. Um, why, but why did it do this? And I see this a lot of times. This, this website is using Astra. And Astra has a, a fancy scroll to option in the customizer that will make things scroll nicely down the page instead of just jumping to any anchor links. When that's turned on, it breaks your skip link. So anyone who uses Astra, do not use that feature. <laughs> or go submit a support ticket right now. <laughs> uh, so anyway, this is an easy fix. We can just go turn that off. It took me forever to figure that one out. But you turn it off, and it works. But I wanted to show you because it's important to not just know that it's there, but know that it takes you right where you want to go. Um, so again, that would be something we would mark as a fail. So the navigation, I don't have drop downs on this one, so it's not a great example. But if you did have drop downs, 
you would want to make sure that you would be able to get to everything in the drop downs. I've seen a lot of times on a lot of themes where the drop down menus don't open. You can't tab to them at all. Um, or you can tab to them and they're tabbing, but you can't see anything because the CSS isn't there to make them visible for on keyboard focus. Um, so you really want to do that. Steve actually gave a talk at WordPress Accessibility Meetup that we'll have a recording for about accessible navs, and we could answer more questions about that later. But so I go through and I make sure I can get to everything that is focusable. Um, so I got to this drop down, that's good. Am I able to control it with my arrow keys and then pressing return to change what it is? Yes, same thing, I hit tab, go to the next one. Um, look, I can't get, we knew that already because we used tabling, but um, I can't get to that button. Now, in this instance, it did actually work because of the way it's been coded. It changed, it changed the content, so now it says enterprise business and social media management. But a person wouldn't know that unless they hit tab or went down, right? So the, the button still has to work, even though the drop downs alone change the content. Um, I don't actually think, like, that I would probably actually mark as a failure because normally we only want people content to change on a submit. So the fact that the content changes when the drop downs change is a WCAG failure. Um, so as far as this specific button, like I, again, I do a lot of just inspecting and looking at it. Oh, look at that. It's a div. What should this be? Anyone know? A button. a button. Look at that. We have that. Now, of course, if we're fixing this, we might be like, oh man, it's, it came from a plugin. I can't change that. So maybe it's easier for you to take JavaScript and inject role equals button. That is sufficient. There's a lot of ARIA. Um, that could be added to divs. Of course, if you can make it the correct semantic HTML tag, that's the best thing to do. Um, but again, so I'm kind of doing a little bit of like checking things out and then looking at them in the inspector to try and figure out what the problem is. But if you're not super HTML friendly, you could still, it would, it would be enough to be like, I can't get to the go button with a keyboard and send that to your developer. And she or he, we'll be able to figure out why. Um, sometimes it's easier to just be like, this is what I, you know, because I know it and I'm just like, the go button is a div. <laughs> I roll emoji. Hey, guys. <laughs> you, don't, you don't like the, uh, it's not permissible to have the a link, like a link be the button either. Is that as bad as so, so this is the thing. Of, a lot of frameworks, you know? Yeah, the thing that's, that's weird about that and what you really want to think about is, and, and we have a check for this in Accessibility Tiger, which the documentation explains really in detail, which we call improper use of link. So a link is intended to be something that goes to another section of a page or um, goes to a different page. And a button is something that submits information opens a modal, triggers an action. So while hitting this, and if I, if I actually, we'll just change this to, uh, let's see, internet traveler who's interested in, oh, look at that, I can't even see the whole drop down. There we go. Free stuff, go. So it does jump to that section, but I still don't think it's a link because it's submitting information and changing the content. So therefore, I think it is a button and not a link. Um, even though part of the function of the button includes the scroll action. I'm a little questionable on the scroll action. I'd have to go back and spend time looking at WCAG and decide whether I even think that's okay. <laughs> um, but. Most of the time you see the opposite. Things are labeled as buttons and they're not buttons. Yeah, yeah actually, so, so the Accessibility Craft website, I'm building an Elementor because I wanted to torture myself. <laughs> And, and well, also, I really want to prove that you don't have to be a developer to build accessible things. And so I intentionally was like, I'm going to use a theme. I mean, it took me a while to figure out what theme I was going to start from. Uh, and then 
I'm gonna use Elementor. I bought a template kit because I was like, I don't wanna design it. Like, I'm gonna pretend that, and also let's be real, I'm not a great designer anyway. Um, but, but a big part of that, or yeah, anyway. So I wanna prove that you don't have to be a developer to do it. So I decided to do it in Elementor. While all of the links that are styled as buttons in Elementor have role equals button on them, which is not actually the case because they're links that just go to a different page. So I a little bit failed because I had to go to Steve and be like, Steve, will you write me some JavaScript to remove that? <laughs> right? And so sometimes I think there are things where you just have to get a developer to fix it. But like a lot of times if you pay attention, you can get very close with out of the box tools. Um, and, and also I could have just decided not to use those little button things. And I could have used, um, like I actually checked the ultimate add-ons for Elementor, they have a button group block that doesn't do that. So I might just say, well, I'm not gonna use the Elementor Pro buttons, but I'm gonna use it from some other add-on for Elementor. Or I'm just gonna add links in a text widget or something. So there are always workarounds, I think, generally. But um, anyway, so, so you want to kind of go through, the goal is to go through and ensure that you can get to everything on the page. Um, so again, this, this is sort of an, an, an interesting test, right? We were here, let's say we were here. We can't get to that, but if I hit this, if I hit tab, so this at least, it shifted focus, and now I hit tab and I'm down where you can't read it because it's hard to read. Um, so I'm making sure every Link. I'm also looking for this focus state. So I don't know if y'all can see this on this particular background, but it's a blue and a white. So I want to be able to see where I am every time I'm going through. Um, I want to see a good focus state. So this website has a pretty good focus state on it. Um, it should have good color contrast with the background. <laughs> so it needs to sufficiently contrast. We typically do a two pixel solid. Um, so let's see, now I'm down here in case studies. It looks like, yeah, this is just text, it's not a link, so that's the link. Um, I, would, I would check this out, because case study, and I noticed, well, there's three case study buttons, links that are styled as buttons. Um, so I, I would kind of, in my head, go, oh, wait, are these, oh, I think I know how to right click by now. All right, like, are these unique in any way? Um, and in this instance, they're not. So there's a couple ways we could make these unique. We could add hidden screen reader text into them. There are tools for doing that in the block editor. Even in Elementor, you can add a span, you know, when you're adding stuff. Um, you could add an ARIA label uh, also. But we need to be able to differentiate between the three case studies links because it's not helpful for somebody to hear link, case study, link, case study, link, case study. Where would I go? Why would I pick case study two versus case study one if I can't see any of the other information? So that's something that I would flag. Uh, let's see. All right, here's a, here's a fun one. You can get our seven-week course. Um, we have very neatly designed forms with a green line underneath and no field outlines. That green fails color contrast. Color contrast applies to borders for fields. Um, you should really have a full border. Designers like to design things like this. Not good for accessibility because people have to know where to click. Um, you know, a, a user that maybe has low mobility but they still use a mouse, it might be harder for them to get into a certain area. So let's show them the borders or the boundaries of where they can click. So I would flag that. I would flag the lack of color contrast. I would also flag that when I start typing in here, Jane, Jane Jetson. Uh, I have now lost my labels. Actually, we haven't looked at this yet, so I don't even know if these are labeled for screen readers at all, because what we were using, placeholder text. Um, even if you have a screen reader label, which I suspect these do, because this is probably a uh, gravity form. Yeah. Um, so let's see, all right, so this field, it does have a label. So a screen reader user would hear last name and they would know, and they'd have no problem with this. 
but you always have to have a visible label even when the information is typed in. And that is for people who maybe have memory issues or who have cognitive disabilities. Um, it's especially important because uh, let's say I go and this website, I don't have anything saved, but um, you know, I did autofill and it auto filled in my name right there in the company name or it put my address because I don't know why. Browsers do weird things. Um, how would I know before I submit the form that it put the wrong information in the company name box? I wouldn't. Um, so I do a lot of that kind of looking at forms. And again, that's something that an automated testing tool can't really tell us because this would not come up as a problem because it would come up as a problem if it was missing this label here. But because this label is present, an automated tool is not gonna realize that this label is visually hidden uh, for people who are cited. So, so that's why you have to do some of this manual testing. So I look for all of that. I'm also going to, when I keyboard test, I'm going to try and submit my form and I wanna see that I have good error messages. Um, one, there's good color contrast, they came up. Um, do they help? So this one, phone format, it's telling me what format is expected for my phone number. Um, <coughs> those sorts of things would be important. And then basically it's sort of the same thing down the rest of the page. Can you tab to everything that you need to and in, engage with everything you need? And those are the basics of what I'm doing on keyboard testing. Um, the other thing I would probably do, but we'll wait and do this with a screen reader, is I would um, try and submit the form. So it is noon, and I'm sure everyone wants to move around a little bit and get some food. So we're going to take a break for about 30-ish minutes, maybe 20 if people want extra time for screen reader testing. Go grab some food, and then... Uh, We'll come back and I'll turn on voiceover. Okay, welcome back. Uh, so, we're gonna talk about screen readers. There are three primary screen readers that people use. Um, they are device specific. So, I am on a Mac. I will be showing you today voiceover. If you have a Mac, VoiceOver is just built into your Mac. You have it, and it's pretty easy to turn on. Um, if you have a Windows machine, then the screen reader you would use would be either NVDA or JAWS. Uh, JAWS is a paid screen reader. NVDA is open source, and it is free. So that is what most people use. The most common, yes. A uh, Chromebook would also use an NVDA. So it works on anything that's, yeah, yeah. NVDA, I think, is going to work on a Chromebook. If it doesn't and you have trouble installing it today, if you haven't tried yet, we can try and figure it out. <laughs> um, the most popular desktop combination for blind people is NVDA Windows using Chrome. That is what they most frequently use. On mobile, the most popular device for blind people is iOS. So they are more frequently going to be using VoiceOver on mobile. Um, there, there are some users, obviously, that use the full spectrum of devices um, and different browsers and, and those different combinations. Uh, but those are the most frequently used. On the slides, I have links to keyboard shortcuts for each one. Um, you have the ability in your settings, and I don't have enough time to go through all of the settings today in um, VoiceOver. If you're really interested in getting proficient, we're actually running some webinars this month on that. Um, one on VoiceOver and one on NVDA with the Carroll Center for the Blind. They are gonna be teaching those. Um, but having these open is very helpful. If you are a VoiceOver user, one of the things that is good to know is that the caps lock key, if you hit it, will make it stop talking instantly. <laughs> uh, when you first turn it on, it will start talking to you. And if you've never done it before, 
it can feel overwhelming. <laughs> so that's what I'm telling you now. Caps lock key. Be quiet. <laughs> um, but basically, there's a whole bunch of different um, keyboard shortcuts. I also have a link to the one for NVDA uh, that you can find and use. So I am going to turn on, I'm going to go back to our lovely Road Warrior Creative website, refresh it. I'm going to turn on VoiceOver. So you can get to VoiceOver if you're on a Mac by going to System Preferences. Um, I'm already actually have it open, but if you go into your accessibility, so it would be here, accessibility, and you enable VoiceOver, and it will start talking immediately. VoiceOver on System Preferences, accessibility, window, accessibility features, table, VoiceOver, wanna... selected. All right. I don't know if we want to volume that down slightly, but. Um. So one thing I like is it has the speech viewer, so you guys will also be able to see what it is saying at the same time. I hope it's not muting itself. Um, that might be someone else's computer in the room. Sorry. That's all right. All good. Um, so what I'm going to do, yes, Steve? Yeah, I can put that on the top. Give me a second. Chrome, Road Warrior Creative Marketing Agency, Web Design, SEO, Social, Google Chrome, Window, WordCamp, Birmingham, Accessibility Testing Workshop, Google Slides, Tab, Group. You are currently on a tab, Group, inside of a group. OK. Um, so what I'm going to do, and I'm going to tell you right now, a blind person does not do this when they go to a website. But what I like to do is I will go to the page and I will ask the screen reader to read the entire page to me. I will watch it go through the page. You're going to see it highlight elements, and I will listen to what it says. What I am doing just initially in that overview is listening for anything that sounds wrong or weird, and then I will go back and re-listen if I need to. Um, a blind person is not going to come to your website and be like, read the entire page to me on every single page. They're going to use shortcuts like headings. They're going to hear lists of links to jump around. Uh, they might even use a search function to search for certain words that they're looking for, if they know what they're looking for. Um, but as a sighted person, I find this helpful for me to compare what I'm seeing visually and to just listen and then go back. Um, so what I'm going to do, and I will not talk over the screen reader. So that is one thing that I do want to say. If anyone ever demos this, I've seen people try to talk over their screen reader. It's so bad. So <laughs> if you ever do that, don't. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to this page, and we're going to listen to what we hear as if we were a screen reader user. And I'm going to make it slightly bigger. R-O-E-T-W-A-R-R-I-R-C visited link image. Road Warrior creative logo banner. Road Warrior creative. You are currently on a link. To click this link, press visited link image. Road Warrior creative logo. List six items. Link. Culture. Link. Services. Link. Case studies. Link. Insights. Visited link. Certified B Corporation. Link. Contact. Heading level one. Two items. W E. All right. So I'm going to stop for just a minute. Um, so on the navigation, what's really important there is it told me list six items. Um, navigation menu should be coded in list. It's really helpful for uh, users of assistive technology because it provides information. So when they heard that right away, they knew how many navigation items there were going to be there. One of the frequent mistakes that I see on a website in WordPress, especially with certain themes, is that let's say I had wanted my contact link to look fancy like a button. Frequently, we see this being done with maybe a widget area added over there, and you stick a button in your widget area, and then what would happen is I would get here and I would hear list five items, and then it would read me the first five, and then it would tell me there is a contact there. So it, that button would be outside of the navigation group. I see this, it's like a very frequent problem. So if you ever want to style that, that's why you can add classes <laughs> so you add classes, and then you style it with the class. Um, so that's something I'm listening for on the navigation menu is, are they all grouped together? Do they have the right number? Um, if we have time later, we could go look at 
a much better navigation that has drop downs and things like that if people are interested. Um, so now I'm going to keep going on the page. Heading level one, two items. W E Bill Brands online. W E Bill Brands online. Heading level three, two. Oh wait, hold on. That sounded a little weird, right? Mm -hmm. W E Bill Brands online. Um, so screen readers can have trouble with all caps. Um, this can happen, and we'll inspect this right now and see. I don't actually know right now. I don't remember if this is typed in in all caps or if we have used CSS. So that's what I'm going to check for right now. WE selected. You are currently in a menu. DevTools, web content, elements panel. DevTools is docked to write. You are currently on a table. To enter this yeah. table, press. All right. So it is typed appropriately. It's using CSS to transform into all uppercase. You should never have anything in all uppercase unless it is an acronym. And this is a really great example of why, um, because the screen reader, even when you're just using CSS, to style it that way. Um, so designers take note. Nothing should be in all uppercase. It's also harder for um, people with certain um, reading disabilities to read things that are in all uppercase. Um, so that's another thing that we think about there, too. Yes. Yes. So for best practices and accessibility, you never use all uppercase on anything. Um, either title case or sentence case is what is recommended. So designers have a really hard time with that. They like to put these, especially when they're doing like the little eyebrow accent headings, they're all like, this is going to be all uppercase. And then this. <laughs> And you just have to tell them, no. like, I went back and forth with our designer in the beginning, and I was just like, I will not approve it. I don't want it. <laughs> um, it's, it's hard, too, because the letters, when they have that, designers are like, it's, they're like, it gives it a uniform shape. But a uniform shape is what makes it harder for someone with dyslexia to be able to read, too. So, so that's not just a screen reader thing, but this is a great example of where a screen reader would read something weird. right? And something like that. It's just extra processing to hear that and have to go w, w E build, oh, we build brands online, right? And so we want to make it as easy as possible and not require extra mental processing for our website visitors to have to figure out what our website says. Road Warrior created marketing agency, uh, web edit text, blank, oops. blank, contact, Sorry. list six items, blank, contact, heading level one, two items, W E build brands online, W E. Okay, I want to talk about this also. You notice how it said two items mm -hmm. inside that heading? That is because we have uh, this span tag here. Because this page, if you load it, it actually has text that changes. <laughs> um, so let me refresh the page, and hopefully it will work. Road Warrior Creative Marketing Agency, web banner, visit blank image. Road Warrior Creative logo, list six items, blank, culture, blank, services, blank. Case studies, blank, insights, visit, blank, contact. All right, so what's happened is we're changing, we have like five, I don't know, four or five different things that we say. We're not looping it, which is actually good because there is a criteria that says anything that plays for more than five seconds has to have a, the ability for a user to stop it. So if we were looping that, we'd probably actually have to have a pause button right next to it that's like, stop this. But here's an interesting thing. If we think those words are important, we amplify personalities, we tell stories, we all of those things, someone on a screen reader, by the time they get to this heading, they're not even going to have that information. All they have is we build brands online. Um, we try very much to advise against this. I don't think it's as common now as it was maybe in 2017 when this website was built. <laughs> um, but that would be a problem. That would be something I would flag because there's no way to get the other information. Also, that reads out as two items because of the span, because we're making one a different color. And that's, again, it's disruptive to know that there's two items in the heading. <laughs> like, we, it should all just be the same color um, and just be one thing without the span class. Uh, if, by the way, if you put like a hard, like a BR tag, that will also sometimes cause it to read multiple items, and the flow is just not good. Right. Edit text, blank, main, blank, Let's go back contact, up to this. list six items. 
Link. Contact. Heading level one, two items. WE. Build brands online. WE. Build brands online. Heading level three, two items. Data-driven strategy and innovative digital solutions for nonprofits, social good, and enterprise organizations. Data-driven strategy and innovative digital solutions for nonprofits, social good, and enterprise organizations. Heading level four, nine items. Army N. Startup. Army N. Menu pop up collapsed button. Startup. Down pointing small black triangle. That needs the whole enchilada. That needs menu pop up collapsed button. The whole enchilada. Down pointing small black triangle. Bell. Army N. Army N. Startup. Startup. Black down pointing small. All right. This is super overwhelming. If you heard that, you would probably leave or you'd immediately try to move forward because you'd be like, I don't even know what's going on. Um, it, ran, it read out the little down pointing triangle <laughs> or something, right? Um, it also told us there's nine items. Again, this is because we have like different things contained in here. Um, I'm gonna actually tab through one of these drop downs. Now remember, these, these drop downs worked for us with a keyboard. Um, so, but what's important to note is just because something works with the keyboard doesn't mean it won't sound strange to a screen reader. I edit text blank. I edit text blank. You are currently on a button inside of a heading level four to display a list of options. Press control option space. Yeah, so it's reading to me as a button. Um, I can use my arrow keys to go up and down on these. But you notice as I move my arrow keys up and down, I'm not hearing anything. Um, and I edit text blank. You are currently on a button inside of a heading level four. It also told me edit text blank, which is what I would expect if it was like an input, like a text field. Like I should be able to type in here, which of course, you know, if even if I typed MD, like. Add. You are currently so, on a button inside of a heading level four to display a list of options. So I could I could type a letter and it might jump me to that thing, but it also just told me I'm on a button. But it didn't tell me what the button is or what it does. So obviously there's a lot, poor Steve. <laughs> uh, there's, there's a lot here that is a little weird. Um, and so this is a great example of something that works okay. I mean, besides the go button, works okay for a keyboard only user, but for a screen reader user, this just, it's not functional at all. And we could look at that for a second. Menu. Less than lead data, next equals three, class equals five. All right. So what we have, and I think this is probably using some third party JavaScript library is what we were dis discussing at lunch. Um, so it's using Selectric with the scroll so these are lists, items, just in a div. So this isn't actually coded as an input or a dropdown at all. It's just been styled to look that way. And then it has JavaScript that makes it work with a keyboard to select and with a mouse to select, but it doesn't have anything that communicates meaningful information to a screen reader. Um, so we can move on. So this is sort of interesting. We're gonna hit go and watch our content scroll up. Node Warrior Creative Marketing Agency, Web Design, SEO, Social, Web Content. You are currently on the web content inside of the group. To enter the web area, press Control, Option, Shift, Down Arrow. To exit this group, press Control, Option, Shift, DevTools, Web Content. Oh, sorry, Main tool bar, Navigation, Scroll Area, Road Warrior Creative Marketing Agency, Web Design, SEO, Social, Web Content. You are Let me just make sure and do it again. Um, I'm trying to see if it'll read me that out when it Edit changes. Black I me and social good org, social good org. Black down pointing small triangle. That means whole enchilada, the whole enchilada. Black down pointing small triangle. Go. You are currently on a heading level four. Heading level four, nine items. I me and social good org. I me and menu pop up collapse button. All right, yeah. So, so this visually scrolled me down. It didn't tell me that there was a change. Um, I'm gonna show you in contrast, of course, this isn't a carousel. I don't have a good example of something like this, but I wanna show you on a carousel, um, something that has really good focus management on it, where when the carousel changes, it moves over. So we have, WCAG on our website, on one of our service pages, we have these carousels that are text carousels. They have navigation dots down below. Um, and just listen what happens when the active carousel changes. Blank. 
FDA to free risk assessment. Double, double WCAG 2.1 WCAG or web content accessibility guidelines serve as the basis of accessibility rule. Go to WCAG 2.1 slide button, list six items. Go to section 504 and 508 slide button. You are currently on the button. All right, so quick point. If you're doing carousels just out of the box, these would do something like go to one of five. That might be five dots. Um, that's better than sometimes they just say button. <laughs> Uh, but even that isn't super meaningful. So if you're building carousels, it's nice to give meaning. So this tells people go to section 508, 504 and 508, so they would know what they would go to if they would select that, as opposed to going to two of five. Um, like, why do I want to go to two of five? So I'm going to hit the return key to trigger this, and then you should visually see the slide move, and then we'll listen. WCAG 2.1, Section 508, and ADA Website Accessibility Audits, Article, Section 504 and 508. These laws most commonly applies to government agencies, K-12 schools. All right. So what we've done there is we have sh made the visual effect happen, but we've also moved the focus to that element so that they are able to immediately start hearing what they heard. So that would be if I was going to keep that scroll up on that website that I don't use anymore. That's what I would expect. It would scroll up, and then I would want it to read the heading and start reading the text to me, not keep my focus up here in the drop down that I've already made a selection in. Mode Warrior Creative Marketing Agent. All right. So we can sort of continue down through Bad. this. Selected blank. Strategically create the marketing vision. You are currently on a blank blank. How we help. How we help. You are currently on a link. To click this link, press control, option, space. All right, so I'm going to just have it read a little bit ahead of me here. Link. How we help. The whole enchilada image. Heading level four. Workforce solutions and help. Heading level two. Connecting individuals to employment assistance services virtually. <laughs> Case study. Heading level four. CSU staff. Heading level two. Building bridges to support STEM education in the community. Link. So this is a really great example of, you know, when we're talking about headings and how they don't make sense. Um, normally, you nest headings hierarchically. We talked a little bit about that before. But in this instance, the, um, the name of the company is a heading four. And then the, like, case study title is a heading two. Well, the way this would sound to someone if they were going through it potentially is that the CSU STEM name would actually be the title, the company that goes with connecting individuals with employment assistance services virtually because it is a four under a two. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so in this sort of instance, there's a couple ways to do it. You could wrap the entire thing in a heading I, what's, what's a little weird about this is there's not really any information. There's just a button. There's, well, a link, sorry, that's been styled as a button under this. Normally, we like to see content below headings. Like, I might not even make these headings at all. They might just be large styled text. And it might be even more helpful to hear that this is a list of three items. So I know that there's three case study items that I could potentially choose from. So maybe these are, even though it's styled this way, it could still be grouped in an unordered list with each case study in an LI. So I'm kind of like trying to think those things too, like what, what might make communicate more information to people um, as we're going through. So this, this, this slider here will be interesting. Um, it, it moves very slowly. But it does go for more than five seconds because it never stops. So it needs a pause button. <laughs> um, someone with ADD might find this really distracting. Um, luckily, we have it set up where, luckily or not luckily, I don't know. Some carousels, when they play like this, every time they change, they read out. They announce the change. So even if I wasn't looking at this and I was higher up on the page or lower down on the page, no matter what I was reading, it might interrupt my screen reader and say, Colorado State University, Lesbians Who Tech, Lean Startup Co, just in the middle of whatever I want. So this is not doing that. I suspect it's not doing that because I can get no information out of it. But we're about to find out. Blank, case study, heading level four, tech jobs tour, heading level two, building diversity in tech, blank, 
Case study. Heading level two. Two items. Error. Clients. Error. Clients. Tommy Superfoods logo. Image. Bond logo. Image. Include.io logo. Image. Tech Jobs Tour logo. Image. Colorado State University logo. Image. Lesbians Who Tech logo. Image. Lean Startup Co. Logo. Image. Top. All right. So, so that was okay. Um, Again, we don't, the break there is what's causing it to read a heading out twice like that. And it's really disruptive. So really you don't want to, it'd be better to not have a break and like style the container or something. So it forces it to go to two lines. Um, I'm gonna turn this back on and we're gonna see if it just like keeps reading. I don't actually know cause I don't remember. <laughs> Tommy Superfoods logo image, Bond logo image, include.io logo image, Tech Jobs Tour logo image, Colorado State University logo image, Lesbians Who Tech logo image, Lean Startup Co. logo image, Tommy Superfoods logo image, heading level two, two items, marketing strategy, perfect. All right, so I didn't, I was, I was actually expecting to get a, a trap <laughs> where we just keep going and going and going, but it, it looks like it didn't. Um, so that's good. I might argue that we don't need to say that it's a logo. Because if the heading is our clients, it's probably enough to have image CSU, image lesbian stack. Like, who cares that it's a logo, right? So again, really thinking about the information. Heading level two, two items. Marketing strategy, perfect your marketing strategy, perfect your heading level four, seven weeks to a better online presence. Enroll in our free digital marketing strategy e-course and receive weekly access to online course materials, including videos, principal oh, worksheets, that. and actionable advice. First name, star first name, required, edit text, list seven items. Oh, that was interesting. Let's see. Oh no, it worked out. I didn't need to go that far though. I just wanna look at, engagement. I wanna look at these uh, check marks. Uh, what's helpful if you wanna get somewhere, just in case you don't know, you can just select it with your mouse and that will shift your focus to that space. So then you can start reading from that point. Um, I'm hitting caps log A and that's what's making it just like start reading from where I am. But again, look at those cheat sheets. Resulting in increased whether you manage marketing for a food brand or social good organization, or you're an entrepreneur just getting started, we will send you relevant, real-world concepts, examples, and information you need to your industry. This course will help you to develop a targeted marketing strategy that increases community and customer engagement, resulting in increased ROI from your digital marketing efforts. By the end of this course, you'll have checkmark a deep understanding of your audience and target demographic, checkmark knowledge of how to write marketing messages that really work, checkmark learn techniques for researching and creating a content marketing strategy. Checkmark, develop an editorial calendar for your blog and social media sites. List seven items. First name star. First name star. First name. Required. Edit text. Last name star. Last name star. All right. I take full responsibility for those check marks that are not in a list. That's totally me. Um, they should be in a list. Also, the check mark is decorative. It doesn't need, it's probably an emoji or like I copied and pasted it somewhere. I'm sure. Uh, so that should be added with CSS. Um, or if we really want to put it there, we put an aria hidden on it and then it won't get read out. Um, the form I thought was a little weird that it, you know, said that it was a list. Um, so we're going to go back up and we're going to kind of listen to the form again. First name star, first name, blank, case study, main, first name star, first name, required, edit text, list seven items. You are currently on the text field, last name star, last name, required, edit text. You are currently on the text field. To enter text in this field, type. Yeah, so that, it sounds okay. It might just be a weird, like, how it was grouped. Normally, gravity forms, like, gravity forms would be what I would recommend for building. So, generally, it's okay. Um, but if you have one, what you want to do is you want to go through, you want to make sure you listen for every field that it makes sense. I don't super love that it's got, like, it says multiple times. Now, why is it saying that, the first name, first name? It's because it's reading out the label that we can't see, and then it's reading out the placeholder. Just don't use placeholders unless you really need to explain the format with a placeholder, but I wouldn't use placeholders at all. Company name, star company name, required, edit text. You are currently on. So another failure that an automated tool won't miss, a screen reader gets this because they hear it's required, but because we've hidden the labels, a sighted person wouldn't actually know that this is a required field. The only field that looks to be required on this form is the drop down, send me the course for. Um, increasingly, we're actually going to, instead of having the asterisks, having the word required because it is more clear. Notice this doesn't have a key that explains the asterisk. And sometimes I've had clients be like, everybody knows what the asterisk means. No. There are people who don't, like, we're all in tech, we know what the asterisk means, but there are plenty of people who don't know what the asterisks mean. 
Um, so we tend to go with like the word required. Um, so. Emails are email required. Underscore, 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 dash, underscore, 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 insertion on word, underscore, 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 between character. So <laughs> this is one area where, you know, gravity forms, this is a default gravity forms thing. It's trying to be helpful because we've set this to require US format phone. People on screen readers have told me, like, they'll listen to it and they'll be like, oh, I get what it's doing, it's trying to tell me, but they're like, it's, again, it's not a failure, but they're kind of like, this is distracting and weird, <laughs> right? And we're all listening to it and we're just like, what? <laughs> So, yeah, that, that off on the screen reader? Um, I don't know. So in screen readers, you can change your verbosity settings and change like how much I have mine set to medium. Um, but I think like, no, I think in an ideal world, we wouldn't have the format here. And if we needed to show the format, it wouldn't be in the placeholder position. It would be in a description above. It's not a clear failure on gravity forms part, but it's like one of those things that's less ideal. Also add me to Road Warrior Creative's monthly newsletter so I can keep up with the latest digital marketing insights and news. Don't want to subscribe to that. Send my free marketing course button main. You are currently on the button. Please contact me so I can learn. Also add me to Road Warrior. Please contact me so I can learn more about partnering with Road Warrior Creative to accelerate. Okay. I was just checking because I hit tab and it skipped it. So sometimes I'd like shift tab, I'll go back and I'll be like, wait a minute. But it's, it has focus, so I don't know why. It missed it, so it's probably fine. Um, link five one two nine four two five eight five eight. You are currently on the link. So, phone numbers are an interesting thing because that is sufficiently fine, um, but it would be really helpful if it actually said like phone number or telephone link, which you could do with an ARIA label, because um, it takes a minute to have to be like. Oh, five one two nine four. Oh, I'm hearing a phone number, especially if maybe they're not from like you don't know five one two is the Austin area code. That might be an extra thing. Um. Link. Find a new client inquiry form here. You are currently on a link in link. Find a new client inquiry form here. Heading level four. Seen on list eight items. Link image forms. Link image. The Wall Street Journal. Link image. CNBC make it. Link image. Buffer. Link image. Nonprofit Learning Lab, Link Image, Pick Business Journals, Link Image, Cooling RV, Dialogue Pop Up, Link Image, Williamson County Sun, Link, Seymour Press, Heading Up. I don't know why that said Dialogue Pop Up on the last one. The other ones were telling me it was a Link Image and it would say like the name, which makes me think, you know, it's going to the Nonprofit Learning Lab website or something. So that's one that I would go back and I would investigate. Dialogue Pop Up, Link Image, Williamson County Sun, List Eight Items. You are currently on the link. So I would just investigate this. Williamson County oh, Sun, and one more item, and one more item, dialogue. You are currently on the dialogue inside of web content. To inter All right, so it's because it opened a article that is a PDF from the newspaper. That's myself and my husband with an iPad. Uh, well, this is really interesting because, so a couple of things with modals. The, there are some general expectations of you should... Um, Shift your focus into it. And if there's any interactive elements, so the buttons we need to be able to hit, they need to be coded appropriately. I should not be able to tab out of it. So I'm just gonna kind of investigate this a little bit. Um, and then there's the obvious of, this is an image of text. <laughs> so unless I have alternative text on this that has every single word in this image that I have here of this article, then obviously that would be a failure. Um, Williamson County Sun, and one more item, and one more item, dialogue, link, close, visited, link, image, Road Warrior Creative logo, banner. All right, so I hit tab and I left. So I did have the close button, but I was able to get out, like miss it. Link, culture, link, services. So why is this a problem? Because if they don't hear the close button and they can leave the modal, they might, it might get in the way of other things, um, or they might be lost and they might be like, I want to come back to this modal. They won't know how to get back to it because now they're at the top of the page. So you have to lock focus in the modal. Um, I'm gonna 
see if I can. Lincoln County sign and one more item and one more item. Yeah, I suspect the alt text on this is just Williamson County Sun, so not very helpful. So now I'm going to close this, and hopefully I go back to the button that triggered it. Williamson County Sun and one dialog pop up. Okay, so that actually worked. It took me back there. A lot of times with pop-ups, it goes like to the footer because the pop-up's actually living in the footer of the website, like below the footer, um, or it'll take you to a weird place. So um, I want to give time for people to test. So let's take uh, maybe 15 minutes. If you have a computer, pull it out. Um, I'm happy to walk around and answer questions. If in, and but my goal was that this would be interactive and that you'd maybe try out some of the tools. Um, so, if there are questions, we can do kind of live Q and A. We can also just take a minute and all work independently, and then come back at the end and discuss what we found. Yes. Yeah, so so the button on this says send me my send my free marketing course rather than submit. I don't think I don't think it's a clear failure as long as there's an obvious heading that um, like and this this isn't right really. So I think what would make this better is um, having a more clear heading above the form that's like subscribe to the seven week e course or something like that. And then you could have a call to action on your submit button. You don't always have to use the word submit as long as there's a clear connection. I think you're right here. Like I might flag that as, is it obvious to all users? And that's sometimes where user testing comes in because it's not necessarily a WCAG failure to not have the button say submit. But if you had several users come and they're going through and they're like, wait, how do I submit the form? Or I don't understand what this other button is. Then you might say to yourself, okay, I need to change the language on my button. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions before we do a little independent stuff? Okay. I'm going to mute myself for a minute and then I can walk around if anybody has any questions. But we're going to take just a few minutes to do some independent found that was interesting or that they did not expect on their website. Yep, do we have the microphone? My game menu is not a list. Okay. Okay. Are you able to tab to it at all? Or not even that? I'm not sure. It, uh, I was just looking at the screen reader like we read it off and it was like list item one, drop down six, list item two, drop down six. Oh, so it didn't even say the yeah. word for the page it goes to. Not at all. Oh man. <laughs> it was a little frustrating. Yeah. Um, well I'm happy to look at that later to <laughs> and give you a tip, but yeah. So that's something, until you turn a screen reader on, you'd never know, right? That's a great example. I mean, a frustrating example, but a decent example for today. Anyone else find anything that they didn't expect? I actually have a page that has... Could you, um, do you mind using the microphone? I actually have a page I created that has three sample accordions. Okay. Um, and it's uh, leader, leaderdog.org forward slash I don't know why it had same, but same dash accordion dash page. Mm -hmm. um, we were trying to figure out if any of these were better than the other at doing accordions, because you know accordions and tabs are such a um, pit of hell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, so that was one of the things because you, you go, you're going along and you're fixing things, and then you get to a tab and a, or an accordion whether it's a block or an Elementor widget or a Beaver Builder module or even a third-party plugin, and then you know everything breaks down because it does so many different things wrong. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Can you kind of list of all the things to look out for when you're doing those? Um, yeah, so on a 
accordion you want so the the element that opens the accordion should be labeled as a button it should tell you with a screen reader um, whether it's expanded or collapsed so that's there's aria roles for that and then any if there are links inside it you shouldn't be able to focus on those links when it's collapsed i've seen that sometimes where you can still go inside there when it's closed um, those are the main things for accordions, which is having an appropriate open and close state and that it's a button. Oh, Steve might have extra, maybe we can take the, let's, let's have him answer this question. Can we take him the microphone? <laughs> All right, I was just gonna add that I think that an area of control is required. Mm -hmm. button that Amber said would then have an area controlled by and it would be equal to the div ID of the element that it's expanding. Yeah. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So uh, do you remember where the, the link for the US web design, uh, where'd it go? Let's see. So the best resources for this is if you go to designsystem.digital.gov um, they have a ton of components where you could look at. So the, I've opened the accordion um, and they have examples of how they should function and different guidance about what's expected. Um, and obviously there's some other, th like you can see the history of when they've been updated and, and that sort of stuff. So, so this is a really great resource if you're trying to figure out what the expected behavior is for something like accordions. Um, or tabs. Uh, with tabs, they should announce that they're tabs. They shouldn't just be a list of links. They should actually tell a screen reader user that they're tabs. Um, should, should, I see this a lot. Accordions, when you do screen readers, say they're tabs. Yeah, that would be incorrect. So, yep. Uh, someone has something over there? Having very little experience with accessibility stuff, um, ARIA hidden is new to me. Is there mm -hmm. an equivalent ARIA explicit or something to force a screen reader to spit something out that wouldn't normally be on a screen to gloss over some of these issues? Um, no. So ARIA hidden equals true is what hides things. If you, But there's no like ARIA hidden equals false. That's not a... a um, an attribute. Um, pretty much if it's there, it will be read out. If something's not in the fo focus order, you can add a tab index to it to force it to be focusable. Um, and, but, but no, there isn't really. So, uh, wait, Steve might have more. I'm not the developer, you guys. I just test things. Uh, you could be referencing to screen reader text. Oh, yeah, maybe. So, so we talk about um, adding screen reader text quite a bit. Um, a good example, so when we were talking about those incorrect um, or like ambiguous links or buttons that don't mean anything. Um, so you can see right here, this just visually says see episodes but they're going to two different places, conversations and meetup. Um, so if we look at this and inspect it, we actually have C and then an SR only span, so screen reader only text episodes. So on a screen reader, they would hear C conversation episodes and likewise C meetup recording episodes. Um, because a sighted person has the context, so they don't need that information. Um, and this is a way that you can make your learn more buttons or like those case study buttons still just say view case study if you don't want it to be the big long name of the company, view blah, blah, blah's case study, um, but convey that information. Otherwise you could do it with ARIA labels too. That's another thing as well. I think I might be about out of time. I am, Happy to answer any more questions um, afterwards. And then if you wanna get a hold of me, this is my contact information. Um, I'm on Twitter. 
I did the Mastodon thing? I don't know. Still trying to figure that one out. <laughs> um, and I run the WordPress Accessibility Meetup. It is free on Zoom, live captioned by a human on the first Thursday at 10 a.m. Central and the third Monday at 7 p.m. Central. Um, you can register for it at equalizedigital.com slash events. And if you go on our website, we also have recordings from every meetup that has ever happened with full transcripts available too. So if you want to find one that's interesting, you can. Uh, thank you so much.